Okay, thanks for joining us. We're going to do a little short uh, education tutorial here on Vexus, and I'm joined by the legendary Shagan, whom we're going to try and have a bit of a discussion about how to do the assessment with ultrasound of Venus excess ultrasound, and we'll go from there. Yeah, um, let's go from so there. Shagan, you use this on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, I use this fairly frequently. I wouldn't exactly say day-to-day, -day, but that, that's because I only will I will only do a Vexus assessment on people who, in whom I. I can see right ventricular dysfunction. Yeah, so that is your uh, that is your um, uh, start point to trying to assess whether you're going to use this is looking at for a congestion in right ventricle dysfunction. Absolutely. So yes. I think that so that's if you look back at the original papers, that's where it was validated, and that's really what it is useful for. So you need to have um, right ventricular dysfunction, a cause for right atrial pressure, and then you then look for the downstream congestive consequences of right Beautiful. ventricular pressure. And so we're going to try and assess first of all the hepatic vein flows, then we're going to look at the portal vein flows, and then we're going to look at the renal vein flows. Absolutely. I think we start with the the IVC um, and then move down to the hepatic vein. Yeah, so nice the question. original VEXA score was four components. So that's IVC diameter, so the IVC diameter of more than 2.1, and then a severe. Ab then you need one or more severe abnormalities in the hepatic um, portal and intrarenal venous flow. Yeah. So one of the things that's going to be a little bit of a problem is we are doing this obviously on a, a normal volunteer, and thanks very much again for doing this. So we're probably going to have a non-dilated uh, uh, IVC, but it's, you know we'll go from there. Oh, fan fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, one of the things I do need is some gel. So first things first, we're going to just try and get a subcostal view. Nice view, man. You didn't try. You just got it straight oh, away. Oh, beautiful. Look at that. Okay, so we're going to go for a subcostal view. I'm going to put the right atrium in the middle of the screen. I just fan up. I fan down till I see that entry point of the IVC into the uh, right atrium. I'm then going to rotate round with my, uh, with my probe pointing up towards the patient's head, optimise my image, and then I just fan gently left and right, and I'm looking for the hepatic vein coming in. Fantastic. And there's lots of Which things you can actually here. There's lots of things you can actually do in that assessment. So my, uh, my friend Philippe Roller, who's one of the authors behind the VEXA score, um, advocates actually looking at the IVC in two axes. So while you're looking initially with this costal and fanning through to find the um, IVC RA junction, you actually get to see the IVC in short axis. It's yeah. a nice way of assessing whether you it, so you can instantly tell whether you've got a massively congested system with a dilated IVC or what he calls a staghorn appearance of the hepatic veins where everything just kind of blows up or Amazing. you might not see any of that. I'll try and do this on the GE machine here using multi-D and you can see there we're doing it in an orthogonal plane so you can try and have a look at it in, uh, in long axis as well as short axis. Fantastic. And you can actually see how, you can see how irregular the shape of it is of the IVC there. So there actually looks a little bit like a teardrop yeah. as opposed to that, a nice big circle that we all presume that it is mm -hmm. for our dimension. Which is one of the problems why it's a bit tricky to use it for mm -hmm. the stench stability index and things like that. Right. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the way to image this. So we're going to have a look at the hepatic vein. Okay, so I, I think with vexus for me, it's really important that we try and get the. Um, it's really important that we try and get the uh, settings correct. So one of the things we're going to try and do first of all is try and look at the scale. So up here in the top right, we've got the scale. Now this. Uh, this is useful for when we're looking for flows of, you know, a meter per second when we're looking at like LV inflow or something like that. When we're looking for venous flows, we've got to turn that down. So I'm turning my scale down here on the color Doppler till I hit around 20 centimeters per second. Okay, so we'll try it something like that. I've then got my gain. And you can see as I turn my gain up here, that is obviously too high gain. I turn that down till I lose that artifact. So somewhere probably around about there. And that's the optimal way that I can then start finding these flows in this hepatic vein that's coming in here, OK? And then I can go with my cursor. I'll try and find that hepatic vein about a centimeter in. And that's where I can start going with my pulse wave to try and assess my, uh, uh, try and assess my flows. The next thing that's really important is now to optimize your pulse wave Doppler. So optimizing my pulse wave Doppler, first of all, I'm, again, I'm going to reduce the scale. So what I'm interested in is filling the screen. Maybe a bit too much there. And then the next part is to look at my low velocity reject. If I've got my low velocity reject too high, I can't see any flows. You see, I've lost all the flows that are in there of, of note. See, it's, maybe you can see it starts coming in, but look at this blackness that we've got there. Mm. So I want to turn that low velocity reject down. And you can see that 
this is where the low velocity reject is now allowing, uh, is allowing flows. You don't want it too low, because then you start to get loads and loads of artifact in there. So you want to just have it up until you start losing that artifact. Mm. Okay? So in some machines, it's not called low velocity reject, it's called wall filter. Excellent. Um, so nice, either yeah. way, so if you yeah, haven't got a yeah, G machine, cool. just make sure that you use it. And the main thing you want to do, so um, my friend Sharon calls that the black snake. You want the black snake gone. Nice. Okay, so let's have a go. I'll just try and get a better, better view there. So there's the paddock vein. There's my pulse wave dot, uh, there's my cursor over the pulse wave Doppler. And here I'm trying to assess my flows. And Shane, what do you think about some of these? You can see it comes in and out of view yeah. a little bit. So you see it comes in and out of view. So one of the things I like to do in people who are awake, so if you go back to 2D, if you just go back to your color, um, get him to hold his breath. And that way you get a nice static picture. There you go, you've got a beautiful view there. You could just pulse wave that quickly to get a nice shot. Okay, now if you freeze that, Breathe that's quite a nice picture. picture. Um, breathe normally. So yeah, so this is, this is a really nice picture. And what you can see here, now the challenge here, um, so there's, there's a number of things that you can see here. So normally you, should, you can see the... Here's the track ball, if you want. So what you can see here is the appearance. So there's, there's the time with systole. So you have a systolic wave of the hepatic venous waveform, which is the S wave here. You've got a diastolic wave that appears after the... Um, that appears between the T wave and the next P wave. And that's the diastolic wave here. And then you should have a short wave of atrial reversal, which appears just up here, which Very is nice. after the P yeah. wave. Nice. Um, and so in a non-congested patient, what you should have is a systolic wave that's bigger than the diastolic wave. Now here, in normal people, you may see some abnormalities. Um, what you can do though, what I find sometimes is if you sample the middle hepatic vein and you sample it quite close to the right atrium, you can often get a little bit of artifact. So um, I'd like to try and go a little bit more distal or sometimes sample it from the, from the, sample it from the um, transhepatic view. Yeah, we'll try and we'll do, we'll do both. The other thing is he was holding his breath at the same exactly. time. Absolutely. Right? There you go. So there you've got, you've actually got S there, D there, and a short wave of atrial wave. S wave there, D wave there, and the S wave is bigger than the D wave when he's not taking his deep breath. Absolutely. Interesting. So, okay, let's and, move on. And as you get more congested, you get a change in pattern. So the S wave becomes smaller, the D wave becomes bigger. Yeah. And when you get severe congestion, you get S wave reversal. Okay. So let's go and have a look at the portal, maybe the hepatic veins in the um, uh, overlooking over the liver. So I'm going to have my marker pointing toward the patient's head. So either the anterior, anywhere between the anterior and mid-axillary line actually works quite nicely. And you're literally just going to go, so if you draw a straight line from where you'd normally go subxiphoid, and just draw that, and just drop that line out laterally, and then just prop your hand either the anterior or mid-axillary line, um, somewhere between the two, you get a really, really nice view nice. transhepatically. And you just need to angle a little bit, rotate a little bit to get in between the ribs, and you get a beautiful view of the liver there. And, and then, I have, so that's at 45 degree angles, I hold it so I'm in between the ribs. Well, if I have it so directly upwards, you sometimes get these kind of rib artifacts that come in with the, with the blacklist that just sort of comes across the, um, the screen. So just a little bit of rotation, Fantastic. and then that kind of hope opens it up. And then you should see two lots of tubes. So there you go. So you've got, you'll have thin tubes with, main, with flow that's mainly away from the probe, that's blue. And then you'll have tubes that are slightly thicker, that are bright and surrounded by fat with flow that's mainly red, that's towards the probe. The, blue, the thin blue tubes are your hepatic veins, and the thicker red tubes are your portal are your portal vessels? So there you can see the left and right portal vein draining into the main portal vein. Beautiful. So why don't we just have a quick look at the hepatic vein again? Just going to put my cursor on there. Hopefully the settings are now all already set. Ooh. Nice demonstration there as he's breathing in and out. Fantastic. Nice, okay, so that's the hepatic vein. And then now we're gonna do the portal vein. So to find the portal vein, you often need to angle your probe anteriorly. So the portal, you kind of look up towards the surface of the patient um, from the side of the probe, and then you'll often get a really, really nice view of the portal vein. And you should see the main portal vein just drop down the center of your screen as this big vessel with continuous flow. Beautiful. Can I just actually, I'm gonna show you the difference, actually, you know, just don't, while we're on color. Watch what happens if I turn my scale up. So if I put my scale up, you kind of end up losing that picture. 
So up to the normal values that you'd have for doing you know, echoes, if you've got that scale too high and the gain too low, you actually can't see anything. It's as I start dropping my scale back down to 20, and I start turning up that gain a little bit, that that's what helps you see the, see the pattern in there. Probably getting a bit of aliasing there, so I'm just gonna turn this scale back up. Absolutely. Let me go from there. All right, so we'll have a look now at the portal, portal vein here. So that's pulse wave Doppler. There we go. So normal portal venous flow is between 20 and 40 centimeters per second. Um, it's normally hepatopetal, so it actually runs towards the head, which means it runs towards the probe, as you can see on the Doppler, on Doppler, on the Doppler profile here. And a normal portal venous flow should be continuous. In this case, there is some mild pulsatility there, and that's, that can be part of a, that's a normal variant. Yeah, if okay. you want to quantify this, you can actually quantify this as a pulsatility fraction by measuring the peak, pulse, um, the peak um, velocity, um, subtract, um, subtracting that from the end diastolic velocity and dividing that by the peak velocity. And a pulsatility fraction of more than 50% is considered to be abnormal for the purposes of VEXIS. Wow, okay, perfect. The next one is the, the hardest one, is when we're looking at the renal, intra the renal, uh, intra -renal uh, veins. So I've got to do another little change I'm going to do on the pulse wave Doppler um, profile as well on this, and I'll just show you that now. So if you're looking at the... You can sort of sit in a similar kind of position and just angle back, or actually move your whole probe posteriorly and look up. And then I'm just going to fan through, trying to find that longitudinal appearance to the kidney there. So I'm just going to turn down the, the turn down the scale, uh, the depth. So people who do any who work in the ED and do um, focus abdominal sonographies for trauma will find this very easy because this is a view that they're used to getting. So just look. So again, from that um, anterior to mid axillary line, you literally just slide your probe down, and as you slide down below the liver, the kidneys just start to appear, and it's a little bit more posterior. So you have to angle your probe back. Beautiful. And then as Sam has got the beautiful view there, he's popped the color on. Um, now, in the critically unwell, getting beautiful renal blood flow like this is relatively unlikely. Um, however, we've got a lovely normal volunteer, so he's got absolutely fantastic intrarenal blood flow. You can, see both, uh, you can see both arterial postal flow, and if with a bit of angulation, you can actually also see venous flow. The arterial flow will be towards the probe, so it'll mainly be red, and venous flow will be away from the probe, so it'll mainly be blue. Beautiful. And okay, let's just show again. So I think these settings that you're going to have on your Doppler are... Uh, so important in this. So again, if I turn up my scale, you'll see how it's really easy then to lose the flows here. So you want to have your scales back down close to 20. If you've got your gain appropriately set, you can really start highlighting where you need to put your pulse wave gate. So because the renal veins are so much smaller, with the cursor, you're trying to look over in the cortex rather than the medulla. And you want to try and, when you're doing your pulse wave Doppler box, open up your sample volume. So I have it closer to eight trying to help me get the best flows possible. And again, in an awake patient, getting them to hold their breath is really, really helpful nice. and can really just enhance, make it much easier to get that intrarenal um, flow that you need. Okay, do you mind just taking a deep breath in and hold it there for me? Or maybe just breathe out a little bit. Breathe out, breathe out, breathe out, breathe out, breathe out, and hold it there. And breathe away. Thank you. Perfect. So we've got a beautiful um, Doppler profile of interlobar vessels. The advantage of the interlobar vessels that you capture is that the arteries and veins tend to run together, which means with a single pulse wave shot, you can capture both arterial and venous flow. Arterial flow above the baseline yeah. um, and venous flow below the baseline. Right. And for the purposes of VEXIS, we are interested in the intrarenal venous component, which is below the baseline. Yeah, nice. The normal intrarenal venous flow is continuous flow as you can see here. As you start to get increasing venous congestion, you start to get interruptions in this flow. So it'll change to what we used to call a biphasic pattern that's now called an, inter, um, an interrupted pattern, which will be a systolic component and a diastolic component, and you'll basically look like two bumps beneath the baseline. And when you start to get severe congestion, your systolic component Lose disappears, component. and you get what we used to call mon monophasic flow, which is now um, formally called severe interrupted flow, and you just get a single bump in diastole. Um, and that is, that's, a, that's your severe congestion shine, and that gives you an extra point on your VEXA score. Fantastic. OK, now, using this score with, you know, we've obviously seen normal appearance now, and you've told us about the congestion. So you've said that you use that only in uh, cases where we're looking at raised right atrial pressure from things like RV dysfunction. What about in just an unselect population of someone who I think might be fluid overloaded? Can I use this? 
I think it's very difficult. And if you look at the increasing amounts of evidence that where the people have tried to apply Vexus, there's actually a study that was published, um, I think, last year, looking at Vexus in a general ICU population. And what they've shown is that in a general unselected population, the incidence of abnormalities is low and it correlates poorly, actually, with overall volume status. Yeah. The bit that does, that may correlate with, with volume states, even in healthy volunteers, is portal venous pulsatility. And there is some work that shows that that may be associated. The big caveat to that is that fit, healthy, normal people can actually have a completely 100% pulsatile portal vein, and that's purely due to the compliance in the, in the, portal, ve in the portal beds. So as things are, um, as an unselected snapshot, I think it's dangerous. Um, as, a, as something that you can use as part of your overall assessment and a continual assessment of, of patients, especially when you've identified at the start that they have element, um, some evidence of raised right atrial pressure or increased mean systemic filling pressure, then I think it's beneficial. Thank you. Thank you very much to our volunteer as well for letting us do this. Uh, I hope that was useful and uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Cheers.